so thank you very much. So thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this conference. So in this talk, I will report on some work uh, which is avail available on the archive at this number. So in this talk, I will talk about the following uh, topics and the relation between them. So in a very general way, the first topic will be low dimensional topology. The second topic will be complex enumerative algebraic geometry. And the third topic will be string theory realizations of supersymmetric gauge theories, so some physics topic. So on the following slides, I have some cartoonish description of each uh, of the topics. So in low dimensional topology, we'll be talking about knots, links, and related object. In a complex enumerative algebra geometry, we'll be interested in counting a configuration of geometric objects satisfying uh, various constraints. And here is a picture of one of the most uh, well-known example of classical enumerative algebraic geometry going back to the middle of the 19th century, the fact that uh, there is 27 lines on a complex cubic surface in a P3. And actually, I uh, mentioned this fact not only for historical purpose, but in fact, this talk will be about the cubic surface and the fact that there are 27 lines on the cubic surface, in fact, will appear uh, later in the talk. And the last uh, cartoon is, uh, so the physics part of the story. So what we'll use is the fact that uh, sometimes a given supersymmetric gauge series of different string theory realizations. And the point is that the string theory often give geometric realizations of uh, gauge theory dynamics. And when you get different uh, string theory realization of the same theory, uh, you get a prediction for relation between the uh, geometric uh, at the geometric level. So in this talk, we'll focus on a very, very particular example. So everything will be extremely concrete. There will be nothing general. And I will not try to address the question of how general it is. So the very specific example will focus in this talk. So from the low dimensional point of view, low dimensional topology point of view, we'll talk about the scan algebra or the four puncture sphere. So is S04 will be the notation for a sphere minus four points. And we'll talk about knots and links in the three manifold, which is a product of this surface cross the interval, open interval zero one. The enumerative algebraic geometry part of the talk will be about counting holomorphic curves in complex cubic surfaces. And finally, the physics part of the talk is about four-dimensional n equal to supersymmetric SU2 gauge theory with four upper multiplets in the fundamental representation. And so essentially, the first part of this talk, I will talk about essentially the low-dimensional topology story. Then the second half of the talk, I will talk about the enumerative algebraic part of the story. And some of the key points will be the relation between the two. And maybe only at the very end, I will make a few comments on the physics part of the story. And so the main point of the talk will be a connection between these two topics. And this connection has some non-trivial mathematical consequence. Once you know it, you can prove some positivity conjecture about this kind algebra, which were done by people studying this kind of thing. And so essentially, you can prove this result about the scan algebra, so some result about topology, something about knots and links in the four-puncture sphere cross interval. And some of the upshot is that you are able to prove such a thing by studying the a priori completely different topic of counting Riemann surface, counting holomorphic curves in a complex cubic surface. In this talk, I will not focus on the applications to the scan algebra. We will very really focus on this connection between these two topics. And once you have this connection, then you can get non-trivial applications out of it. Okay, so here is a diagram. So uh, you are not supposed to understand what is in this diagram. So the only thing is that on the right, there will be the enumerative geometry. On the left, there will be the low-dimensional topology. And on the bottom, there is a physics. And I will come back to this diagram at the very, very end of, of the talk. OK, so the plan is first I will talk about the low-dimensional topology part of the story. And so the main character will be the cubic surface and some affine version, some affine cubic surface, which will appear as SL2C character variety. 
And then I will talk about this quantization given by three-dimensional topology via the sky and algebra. Then I will talk about the enumerative geometry part of the story, which involves mirror symmetry and curve counting on cubic surfaces. And then we, here we have a different quantization story, which involves iogenous curve counting. And the main point of the talk is a comparison between the quantization of this cubic surface geometry given by three-dimensional topology by the scan algebra and the one given by iogenous mirror symmetry, so the one given by enumerative geometry. Iogenous means you're talking about disk or the difference between the disk and allogenous? Yes, iogenous, let's say iogenous compact curve. Okay, so let me start at the uh, very beginning by saying uh, very generally a few words about uh, character varieties. So if you have, if you have gamma, a finitely uh, generated group, and G, a reductive algebraic group of a complex numbers like GLNC or SLNC, then you can uh, construct an affine variety of uh, group morphism from gamma uh, to G. And there is natural action of G on this affine variety given by a conjugation action of G on uh, representations of gamma in G. And then you can take the quotient in the sense of geometric invariant series. So here is simply some affine quotient. And you get something called the character variety. So it's an affine variety whose ring of function is a space of function on this affine variety of representation of gamma in G, and you take the G invariant part of this algebra function, and you take spec of that. You get some uh, affine algebraic variety. And so we'll be particularly interested in the case where gamma is a fundamental group of some interesting topological space. And even more specifically, we'll focus on the class where sigma is what I denote by SGL, which is a topological surface, which is a complement of L points in a genus G compact orientable surface. And so what is a specific in this case of character variety for surfaces is that this space, this character variety, admits a natural uh, Poisson structure. There is a natural Poisson bracket on the algebra of regular function on this uh, affine variety. So I will not say uh, what this Poisson bracket is in general. I will just give you some example. So if you just take L equal to zero, so just a compact uh, topological surface, and if you take your group G to be simply GL1, just C star, then the character variety is simply C star to the 2G. Essentially, because C star is abelian, you map from pi 1 to C star factor through first homology, which has wrong 2G. And so you get your character variety C star to the 2G. And be again, because C star is abelian, conjugation is trivial, so there is nothing to, to divide by. Okay, so ERC space is very simple, it's just a complex uh, algebraic torus. And uh, so geometrically, function on this torus monomial. You can think about them as being monodromy around element of a basis of homology. So the element of the form Z to the gamma, where gamma is some uh, homology class. So if you're on the class of a curve on your surface. And then the Poisson bracket is given by the following uh, formula. So the Poisson bracket of Z to the gamma i with Z to the gamma j is equal to pairing between gamma i gamma j times Z to the gamma i Z to the gamma j, where the pairing is simply the intersection number between the corresponding homology class. So some slightly more interesting example, which will be the example in which we will be focused in this talk, is a case g equal to zero. So you start with a topological, some sphere, two-dimensional sphere, and a equal, l equal four. So we move four points from the sphere. So it is what this picture is supposed to represent. You have some sphere, and you remove four points out of it. And you take for group G, the group SL2C. So something a bit so unlike the previous example, where I was only taking C star, something abelian, here I take something which is non-commutative, SL2C. And in this case, the corresponding uh, character variety that I will denote by X. So it is a SL2C character variety for the four puncture sphere. It is an object which is known since the end of the 19th century. And it is known since the end of the 19th century that is X can be described as a four-parameter family 
of affine cubic surfaces. So x has dimension 6, complex dimension 6, and it's a family of surfaces depending on four parameters. And I will tell you explicitly uh, what it is. So one way to get uh, functions on this character variety is to take trace of the monodromy around loops on the four punctual sphere. If you have a loop uh, in this picture, and if you have a representation of your fundamental group, you can just look to the image of your loop in the fundamental group. You apply a representation, you get an element of SL2C, and then you take the trace of this element and you get a number. So, so trace functions of monodromy around loops are ways to produce functions on these character varieties. And the claim is that you can generate with this algebra. So as an algebra by uh, essentially taking seven loops and you will get seven generators. So there is A1, A2, A3, A4, which are traced around the small loops around punctures. So in this picture, there is obvious loop. For each point you remove, you can consider a small loop around this puncture and you get four of them because there is four punctures. And then there are more interesting loops that I will call gamma v1, gamma v2, gamma v3, which are the loops which separate the four puncture sphere into two pair of pumps. So gamma v1, I guess, for example, will be the horizontal cycle here. Gamma v2 will be the vertical cycle here. And gamma v3 will be some kind of diagonal thing, producing a third uh, pond decomposition, pair of pond decomposition. Can I ask a question? Sure. So why did Fulk and Fricke care about the character variety? Yeah, so essentially, uh, they were studying uh, linear differential, second order linear differential equations. And so with, I guess, with regular singular uh, singularities. And so in this case, so you can study differential equation on P1, where you have four singularities, and study the monodromy of these uh, differential equations. They will produce uh, I mean, the monodromy would be an element of C space x. OK, so I just said that there are seven generators corresponding to seven particular loops. And in fact, these seven generators satisfy a single equation, which is written explicitly here. So, maybe, so this thing was already known to, I say, in the 19th century. And so now what is important here is that you should think to A1, A2, A3, A4 as parameters. And then once you fix them, there, re there remain three variables, gamma v1, gamma v2, gamma v3. And this equation is cubic in gamma v1, gamma v2, gamma v3, because it starts by gamma v1, gamma v2, gamma v3 equal something, which actually is at most quadratic in the gammas. So if you fix the uh, AIs, you see that this thing defines you some affine cubic surface in like affine three-dimensional space. But previously you said that it was a four-parameter uh, four family of cubic uh, uh, surfaces, but then uh, it's eight-dimensional, right? And then here you have it's uh, six-dimensional thing. Yeah, I say it is that it was a four-parameter family of surfaces, so something six-dimensional, four plus two. Four-dimensional four parameters and surfaces. So here are the four parameters A1, A2, A3, A4, and my surface is defined by this cubic equation. And here, and you can write down explicitly what the, so I claim that on character varieties there is always a natural Poisson structure. And here in this example, you can write explicitly uh, what it looks like. And so maybe some remark for why uh, this story will be uh, non-trivial is that the bracket of gamma v1, gamma v2 will be equal to gamma v1, gamma v2, so this thing looks exactly what was happening in the case where my group was C star. If you remember, can I go back enough? Here, you see roughly the Poisson bracket of two trace functions, which are just a product of, trace of the corresponding trace function. Yeah, and the point is that in this example, it's, it's like true at the leading order. The Poisson bracket of gamma v1, gamma v2 is a product of gamma v1, gamma v2. But then there are correction terms involving gamma v3. So this problem in three variables, you cannot split it into problem involving only two variables, which will be what happens in the case of the torus. Okay, so this thing is a summary of the geometry that we have, where C space x. 
this SL2C character of the four-point class sphere, and as I already repeated, it is a family of affine cubic surfaces over a four-dimensional uh, affine space parameterized by A1, A2, A3, A4. And I guess this slide is just some advertisement slide for this uh, geometry, which is that uh, this geometry appears in many different contexts. So first of all, it's a character variety. And as any character variety by Riemann Hilbert, there will be some analytic isomorphism with a modulus space of flag connection with regular singularities. So which is related to my answer to Kiosk question. It has to do with second order uh, linear differential equations. And then by the non abelian Hodge correspondence, this space is in fact homomorphic to a modulus space of parabolic x models. And uh, then you have some etching elliptic fabrication story. And in a physics language, this thing will be the cyberhydroid Witten geometry for this particular SU2 uh, gauge theory. Something very much related is that uh, the smooth fibers of this uh, family of surface, so these affine cubic surfaces, admit complete uh, hyperkähler matrix. And something which is maybe a bit more specific to the four point sphere, this space is a so-called phase space of the point of the sixth nonlinear differential equation, which is isomodonomic condition for these second order linear differential equations. And so in this talk, we'll focus on a question which is slightly different from all these relevant facts, which is a question of quantizing x. And as I will review in one moment, is quantization in the same sense as in the previous uh, lecture. It's in the sense of deformation quantization. So I explain x is an affine variety. Its algebra function is a Poisson algebra. And so you might try to produce a one parameter non-commutative deformation of this Poisson algebra uh, which uh, will be the definition of quantization. And I will explain that there is two possible approaches to address this question of quantizing x. The first one is in some sense well known, it goes through three-dimensional topology and the scan algebra. And the second is, I guess, not well known and it involves some iogenous version of mirror symmetry. And the natural result of the talk will be that these two ways to quantize this geometry uh, will agree. OK, so I guess this definition essentially already appeared in the previous uh, lecture, that if you have a Poisson algebra, then a deformation quantization is a flat formal one parameter family of associative algebra, A h bar, such that when you set h bar equal to 0, you recover your starting algebra, and such that uh, if you measure the node commutativity at the first order in h bar, you recover uh, the Poisson bracket. And so once you have this general deformation quantization question, you can ask various, various natural questions like, uh, does such a thing exist? Is it unique? And the kind of thing we'll focus on in this talk is, can we find nice deformation quantizations? And I will say a bit more what nice uh, means in one moment. So you can ask this question for any uh, Poisson algebra. And so in particular, you can ask here for the algebra function on the character variety and in particular for the very specific example, which is of interest for us in these talks, x, the character variety, SL2 character variety on the four puncture sphere. Okay, so here is an example of deformation quantization going back to the simple case where I have no puncture and where my group is simply GL1, simply C star. In this case, I explained that the character variety is simply a complex algebraic torus, simply C star to 2G, and I wrote explicitly this quadratic Poisson bracket. And in this case, a nice deformation quantization is provided by the so-called quantum torus, so which is an associative algebra, which has a linear basis given by monomial Z hat to the gammas, and where the product is given by the uh, yeah, and, we, and the, this monomial z add to the gamma satisfies this commutation relation. z add to the gamma i is z add to the gamma j is equal to the same thing with the two factor reversed to the price of a power of q to the power of the pairing gamma i, gamma j. And so in this formula, this formal parameter q is related to the h bar parameter in the definition of formal quantization uh, through the change variable q equal exponential h bar. So it's an exercise to take this uh, quantum torus algebra 
you write q got exponential h bar, and to check that c thing is indeed a deformation quantization of the complex uh, algebraic torus. And it is nice in the sense that the dependence in h bar is not any uh, formal prior series, but it is through these simply exponential function. And once you express everything in terms of these uh, q equal exponential h bar, everything become uh, uh, rational in q. H is real or complex? So in this talk, uh, everything is, is formal. But in fact, once here in this picture, once you, I mean, in the general definition, everything is formal. But here, once you know that the dependence is only through q equal exponential h bar, then you can take h bar anything such that exponential makes sense. So you can take real or complex. And uh, as I say, so very concretely, the problem we have, if we consider this SL2C character variety, I wrote previously explicitly the Poisson bracket. It's not so obvious uh, how to write an analog of what we did for the quantum torus. Precisely of this issue I was talking about, that the variables are not decoupled. The three variables somehow are all mixed. And so it's not clear what to write down. So in fact, there is a general way to construct deformation quantizations of character variety, which is given by the theory of scan algebras and which is coming from three-dimensional topology. And so because I will only consider this SL2C story, I will only describe this kind of algebra story for SL2C. OK, so here I'm describing some, the way I've presented thing I introduce is character variety, let's say for SL2C, for the four function sphere. It's an example of Poisson variety. You can ask, and then you can ask the algebraic problem, how do you produce a quantization? And now I claim that one solution to this problem that people found back to the maybe end of 80s, beginning 90s, is that three-dimensional topology provide one way to do that. And I will review that now. So I'm talking about three-dimensional topo uh, topology. So we'll talk about knots and links. And uh, a frame links is a link with a nowhere vanishing section of its normal bundle. So very concretely, it's a link. It, each component of the link is realized as a boundary of an annulus in your stream manifold. And then there is something called the Kaufmann bracket scan module of any oriented stream manifold. It's a module of a, a ring, uh, Z bracket A plus minus, so long polynomial in a formal variable A. And it's a module that you obtain by taking all possible frame links in your stream manifold. So you just take the free module over all possible isotopic classes of frame links. It's a very, very big modules. And then you quotient by scan relations, which have uh, these follow-up shapes. So, so each time locally, uh, your frame links look like that. You can replace it by this relation. Or each time your link is union of uh, a knot, which is not linked to the link, you can remove the unknot component to the price of adding this factor. And in this picture, because everything is framed, uh, everything has vertical framing. So there is everything as vertical going out from the screen. So what is the definition of framing? Yeah, so uh, it was written on the previous slide. So framing is just a knot with a nowhere vanishing section of its normal bundle. Well, more concretely, it's one way to view uh, your knot as uh, a boundary component of some analysis. OK, so, so this Kaufmann bracket scan module is one way, starting from a three manifold. You take all possible uh, frame links, you impose this relation, you get some module. And uh, so for example, if your three manifold is R3, you can show that this module is simply the base ring of Laurent polynomial in the variable A. And in fact, if you take a frame link in R3, and if you look to its class in the scan module, so it will be an element in the base ring, and it is a so-called Kaufmann bracket polynomial of this frame link, which is essentially equivalent to the data of the Jones polynomial of your uh, link in R3. Okay, so the point is that if you take R3, this Kaufmann bracket scan module is just the base ring, 
and it is just where essentially the Jones or Kaufman bracket polynomial is living. So somehow this uh, Kaufman bracket scan module, it's come out historically from trying to generalize the Jones polynomial story to more general three manifold. And so in this talk, we'll focus on three manifold, which has a very particular form. They are the ones which are product of the oriented two manifold by an interval. In this case, your scan module has an algebra structure given two frame links L1, L2 in your surface S cross the interval. You essentially get a product by placing your link L1 on top of L2. You stack the link on top of each other as this thing defines you a product. And it's a product which essentially by construction is associative because if you stack things on top of each other, it's an associative operation, but it's not commutative in general. Because essentially when you try to push one link through the other, you will have crossing, and to know what happens, you need to apply scan relations, and so something non-trivial uh, can happen. So, uh, here's the question. Yes? Do these counter varieties admit quantization by viewing them as cluster algebras and passing to the quantum cluster algebras? Yes. Uh, roughly, yes. And um, so, so, so there is some up to some technical details which has to do with SL2 versus PSL2. Uh, the answer is uh, roughly yes, and it will somehow agree with the story uh, I'm uh, describing. So is that the same as this uh, scheme thing? Sorry? Is that the same as the scheme thing? Yeah, so, so the claim will be the whatever you construct in the cluster thing will be the same thing that I'm describing here. And in fact, uh, as consequence, for some reason I do not want to focus on the cluster point of view here. But as consequence of the full story, you can prove stuff which were conjecture in the cluster language. So I have a question. Uh, yes. So you made the remark that this is not commutative. I, did not, in I don't know the pictures. Means can you please show the pictures? Means stack one after another, you say. Yes. Uh, how, how, if you can show the pictures. Means you say, I cannot imagine just by looking at the thing. You can even draw something so that I can learn. I don't think I can draw uh, anything, <laughs> but I can try. I mean, so. <laughs> So, so here is my uh, surface, here is my interval, and at some level I put some link, uh, I don't know, some, I don't know how to draw some link, something here, and then at some up, so this thing is whatever, uh, L2, and then uh, here is another, I don't know, L1, and by definition the product of L1, L2 is simply the union of these uh, two nodes. So just a link in your three manifold and this thing is a product. And then why it's not commutative? And so what, sorry, I just still that you don't understand. Yeah, so here is in this picture, L1 is placed on top of L2, and it's not commutative because uh, you cannot pass continuously from the picture with L1 on top to the picture with L2 on top, in general. So you have an underlying assumption of homotopy, kind of. And so you have to pass, you have some underlying assumption. So, so I don't know if it's related, but all the, all the things are considered up to isotopy, up to continuous. Uh, deformations, embedded continuous deformations, and the claim. So, in fact, in some cases, in fact, you can move L1, L2 without crossing, but it's like it's like the non-generic uh, situation. Generically, you will have to cross, and then it will be because of this crossing, you will get non-commutativity. Okay, so the claim is that in the case, so I was describing a surface cross interval. So just from this picture, you get an algebra. And uh, the claim is that uh, for this kind of geometry, in fact, this algebra has a natural basis uh, at the linear level, a linear basis given by the so-called multicurves. So the idea is that the multicurve, so it's a curve living on the surface no longer in the threefold, just on the surface. And it is a union of finitely many disjoint, compact, connected, embedded, one-dimensional submanifolds of your surface, so that none of them bound the disk. So it's just a collection of curves drawn on your surface, which are not intersecting, and so that none of them bound the disk. And it's clear that if you have such a curve on the surface, if you view the surface embedding in this threefold product, in particular, it is an example of 
link in dimension three. And you can put some obvious framing coming from to the vertical third direction. And the claim, so this theorem of Pristicki tell you that isotopic classes of multicurves, in fact, form the basis of the scan algebra uh, as a module. So from some kind of linear point of view, module point of view, you kind of understand reasonably well what the scan algebra is. And now here is a claim that the scan algebra is a solution to the deformation quantization question I was asking previously. The claim is that this scan algebra, so in general it's an algebra over this ring of Laurent polynomial in a variable big A. And if you set big A equal minus exponential h power over 4, then this thing is a deformation quantization of the algebra of regular function on the SL2C character variety of your surface. And essentially, uh, the isomorphism when you specialize A to minus 1 is obtained by sending a multicurve, so which, as I say, are basis of this kind of algebra, so this collection of curves drawn on the surface, the corresponding function of the character variety is just the uh, uh, trace along the various components of your curves. So the most is multicurve in the scan algebra are some kind of lift of this trace function of the character variety. And so some more, so okay, so the long story of people approving this statement. And one way to understand why it's true is to look to the classical limit of the scan relation. And the claim is that the classical limit of the scan relation recovers this kind of relation between traces uh, at the level of uh, SL2. So this thing is just identity for matrices in SL2C. And the claim is that when you pass from this multicurve to trace function, the scan relation will reproduce this kind of uh, identities. Okay. Classical means h bar goes to zero. That's yes, yes, that's true. Okay, so the previous theorem is like general for any SL2C character variety of a surface. The theorem tells you that uh, the scan algebra produces a deformation quantization of the character variety. In particular, we can apply it to the very specific case of the four puncture sphere. And maybe I skip some detail, and essentially you just compute the scan algebra. And people uh, doing uh, uh, not theory have computed the scan algebra, the four puncture sphere, and they just wrote down the, the answer. So here is the answer. So before gamma v1, gamma v2 were commuting, and now they no longer commute. So here you have some kind of commutation relations which tell you how they no longer commute. And previously, the commuting variable gamma v1, gamma v2, gamma v3 were satisfying some, um, some cubic uh, relation. And now this cubic relation uh, in the scan algebra, in the non-cumulative level, this cubic relation is deformed in this cubic relation. So there are also this non-commutative deformation of these cubic surfaces, um, or final surfaces more generally. Can you, does that match in any way? What do you mean? Oh, I, don't I think if you have like P2, for example, you can have non-commutative deformation, and more generally also final, final surfaces. Um, can you view this some sort of as a non-commutative surface? I mean, definitely you should think of this thing as a non-commutative surface. And then maybe your question is how to compare it with other notions of non-commutative surface. And, uh, and let me say, I'm not sure. It depends how precisely. Maybe you can ask me later which notion of non-commutative surface you are taking. Okay. So the point is that this thing are just deformation of the previous equation, except now everything depends on the variable big A. Okay, when we set big A equal to 1, you recover the ordinary equation of the cubic surface. And what was not obvious were, was where to put the correct powers of A's. For example, in the original equation I wrote, here there was a minus 4. And the claim is that uh, in the quantization, this 4 should be replaced by minus 2, 2 times A to the 4 plus A to the minus 4. And so some of the scan algebra story tell you that it's correct to replace 4 by this polynomial in A and not something else. Okay, and so these non-commutative surface appear in many, many different places from many, many uh, different points of view. Is there any question about this uh, story? So there is this character right here, the four puncture sphere. I want to quantize it. There is this general scan algebra story, which works for any SL2C character variety. 
you just apply it for cis geometry and you get some explicit answer, some explicit presentation by geometries and relations of this kind of algebra, which produce some non-commutative version of the cubic surface. Okay, so if there is no question, I will somehow uh, change topic and start talking about the different, a different way to produce a deformation quantization of the cubic surface, and which has to do with uh, enumerative geometry. And uh, maybe first, it has to do with uh, mirror symmetry. So very generally uh, speaking, mirror symmetry is some connection between, let's say, two Calabrian varieties. It has a property to exchange symplectic geometry and complex geometry. And let's say from the point of view of this talk, it's better to think about the case of non-compact Calabrian varieties. More precisely, the case of log Calabrian varieties, which appear yd, where y is a smooth projective variety, and d is an anti-canonical divisor. And in this case, the complement y minus d is a non-compact, let's say if uh, d is non-empty, is a non-compact uh, Calabrian variety. And so for this talk, essentially, I will use nothing about mirror symmetry, except that it's a way, it's essentially, it's a, it predicts that you should be able to construct algebraic variety. If you have a, a variety, its mirror should exist. And people studying mirror symmetry think about ways to construct this mirror. And in particular, we will use the fact that in dimension two, in this kind of uh, this kind of thing we care about in dimension two, uh, there is a mirror symmetry construction for low calabrian surfaces due to growth like in Kel. And here the thing is wrong, it's probably 2011. And this construction involves enumerative geometry. So this thing is a part which is slightly surprising and which is coming from mirror symmetry, which is that to construct some algebraic variety, you do that by doing enumerative geometry in another algebraic variety, the one from which you are trying to construct the mirror of. So the idea is that uh, if you have a log Calabrian surface yd, by some appropriate counts of rational curves in this pair, then it's possible to construct its mirror family. And its mirror family, here I wrote it curly v, goes to spec c bracket any of y. So any of y is a cone of effective curves on y, and c bracket is a corresponding uh, monoid algebra. So essentially, the mirror construction gives you a mirror family whose base is roughly, uh, let's say, h2 of y. And it's expected because from mirror symmetry, your complex parameter here should be related to the symplectic or color parameter on the original thing, which has to do with uh, essentially H2 uh, cohomology. And so the claim is that it is possible to recover the particular geometry we care about, this X, this family of affine cubic surfaces over A4, can be obtained as an output of, some, of such mirror symmetry construction. And this mirror family is obtained by applying the mirror symmetry construction to a pair YD where y is a smooth projective cubic surface, and d is a triangle of lines on y. So y, smooth projective cubic surface, from the very beginning, I said there's 27 lines on such cubic surface. And in fact, you can find a triple of lines, which form a triangle uh, configurations. And you take that for d. So here, there is something which is possibly uh, very uh, confusing y is a cubic surface, and then I construct its mirror, and then its mirror is a family of cubic surfaces. So you should not mix uh, the two sides. So somehow the object we want to quantize is the mirror family, but the place where the curve counting will be happening will be the mirror cubic surface. So shall we complain that some of the cubic surface has h2 equal to 7? Uh, yeah, you, you should complain. And uh, so essentially, there is a way, if you do things properly, you get a seven-dimensional family, but there is a natural action of a three-dimensional torus. 
coming from the fact that this D has three components, and when you quotient by this three-dimensional torus, you get this four-dimensional family. Okay, so here is a short description of the kind of enumerative questions uh, you need to study to solve, uh, to make this construction. So Y is a smooth project surface, and D is an anti-canonical cycle, let me assume, of rational curves. And then, if you fix a curve class on your surface, uh, the kind of enumerative question which enter in this mirror construction are rational curves, so really honest genus zero compact uh, Riemann surfaces in Y of class beta, which has a property to intersect the anti-canonical divisor D in a single point. So maybe there should be a picture somewhere. So here is a picture, let's say, of my cubic surface with three lines D1, D2, D3 on it. And then I'm looking in Y to rational curves, which has a property to intersect this triangle at a single point. And this single point could be somewhere in the smooth part of the triangle, or it could be somewhere in the corner of the triangle. And it's possible to parameterize the choice of possible essentially contact orders or tendency conditions with the uh, uh, boundary components of the triangle. So, here, so there is this set called B of Z. So essentially for each corner of this triangle, you construct a two-dimensional cone. So here from this triangle, you get these three cones, each corresponding to one corner of the triangle. And why you are doing that? Because each integral points in this cone, you can think about it as defining a contact order for your curve along the divisor. If you take some integral point, which is on one of these ray here, and this ray corresponds to this divisor, and if this point is some integral multiple of the primitive generator here, let's say d times the primitive generator of this ray, then you interpret this point as a, a specifying your curve to have contact order D with the divisor at the unique point of intersection. And now if you have a point in the interior of the cone, so specified by two integers inside this cone, then it means that you're considering some curve going into the corners and the contact orders along the two components of the triangle meeting at these corners are given by these two integers. Okay, so roughly there is some kind of space of integral points which parameterize all possible uh, ways your curve can intersect uh, the triangles at the single point. Yeah, I mean, you are counting like holomorphic or algebraic curves. So when I say effective class, it's just some class which is represented by uh, some holomorphic or algebraic curve. I mean, it is in play in the fact that, uh, yeah, maybe at this point it's not fully clear uh, what, what, what we are doing. So, so the point is that we are counting these curves. So for every beta, for every beta curve class, you will solve this enumerative problem, counting this curve with this given class, with given contact order, meeting the boundary in one point, and then you will get numbers. So this thing is just enumerative geometry, you have a surface, and you get a lot of numbers out of solving this enumerative problems. And uh, maybe before answering your question, I'll just give example in our concrete uh, geometry. Uh, why was a smooth projective cubic surface in P3 D a triangle of lines on C is a cubic surface? And I said at the very beginning there is 27 lines on such cubic. So already three of them form uh, the boundary D. So there is 24 of them remaining. And the claim is that each of the 24 lines not contained in D intersect D in a single point. So you have this kind of picture where uh, you have for each side of the triangle, you have like eight lines which will intersect uh, this side in exactly uh, one point and, not, and nothing else. So, so, this curve are so these lines on this cubic surface are examples of curves we are counting in this problem. Can you say again, what, is, what do you mean by quantization? Uh, quantization was you have a Poisson algebra. Mm -hmm. commuta so it's a commutative algebra with a Poisson bracket. And yeah, it's quantization in the sense of deformation quantization. So it's mean construct a one parameter family, okay. depending on which bar, which deform your commutative algebra into some algebra which is typically non-commutative. 
and whose non commutativity is controlled by the Poisson bracket. Okay, so what you're saying sounds like deformation. So, what does I never understand what the word quantization means? Yeah, I mean, in some sense, here yeah, just an example of a deformation as associative algebras. It just is just particular type of deformation as associative algebras. So here, the point is, there is a Poisson bracket, and the deformation is constrained by uh, this Poisson bracket. This become on the last slide. Yes. As like the crossing point of the three lines corresponds to what the object on the left hand side. Sorry. The crossing point on the three lines on the right hand side. Ah, uh, here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I was trying to explain before that this picture is like a cone for each corner. And that the integral point on this picture correspond to, ta to various tangency conditions for your curve along the boundary of the triangle. So here the point V1 here is like a primitive generator of this ray. And so this thing corresponds to curve intersecting this side of the triangle at a single point with contact order 1. And, in it, and all these lines are examples of such a thing. They all intersect this side with contact order 1. So the corresponding uh, contact order or tolerance condition is this point uh, V1. So the crossing point is, has no correspondence You mean the point here? Yes. Yeah, so this point will be like zero. It will be a curve like touching no boundary of the triangle. Okay. And such a curve, in fact, do not exist because the boundary is ample. And so we can forget about it. OK, I will skip that. And so here I will uh, maybe go quick. So as I was saying, from solving these enumerative problems, uh, you get collection of numbers. Sorry. You get collection of numbers, this count of rational curves. So what does it have to do with constructing a mirror geometry? The point is, so this construction of, uh, which is in the paper of uh, Gross, I can kill, involves constructing a mirror geometry essentially by gluing uh, simple local models. And uh, you glue these simple local models by some non-trivial uh, gluing maps. And these gluing maps are essentially generating series of the numbers we computed by solving the enumerative problems. So some of these things is a point which should sound slightly mysterious, but it is what uh, more or less mirror symmetry uh, tells you to do, to use these numbers, these count of fractional curves, you construct generating series out of them, and more or less uh, you use these generating series to define gluing transformations uh, between simple pieces. So I will not give more details. Here is some rough picture of how it works. Uh, so roughly for each vertex of this triangle, there will be a simple uh, algebraic variety which has some very explicit uh, description. And these three varieties will give you essentially three patches on the family you are trying to construct. And you glue these patches together according to some gluing transformation, which involves in that definition all these count of rational curves I was describing previously. Can I ask a question? Yes. Well, uh, should you view this mural uh, variety as an as a actual family, or it's a, a variety with a regular function? Yeah so, yeah, so I mean, you get some variety with, uh, in fact, you get some affine variety with a ring of regular function. And the claim is that this thing naturally comes uh, as a family over what I was describing, the spec of the cone of effective curve. And the reason for that is that when you form generating series for your environs, it's naturally to have a variable t to the beta uh, keeping track of the curve class beta. So all these generating series have parameters uh, for curve classes which is why what you construct is something which depends on these t parameters, and which is why the resulting uh, thing is, is, a, is a family over these t variables. And in general, there are convergence issues, uh, but for the example I'm describing, everything converges, and you get some honest uh, algebraic family. Yeah, okay. my question was more like, wh why do you get a family, not a single variety? Yeah, so you get a family because you have these variable t's. So the specifying one value of t is like uh, fixing one particular fiber. So the Hodge number of the of mu is related to y or? Sorry? 
Taj number of y is related to mu. Taj number of mu. Yeah, so yeah, because it's like non-compact, it's slightly uh, subtle to phrase. So, OK, so here I was starting with a projective surface, a triangle of line. And I construct this family. So I start with a projective cubic surface and a triangle of line. So the complement is a affine cubic surface. And here, somehow, the mirror is itself a family of affine cubic surfaces. So somehow in this kind of two-dimensional situation, the kind of two sides of the mirror, at least topologically, in fact, they are the same. It's like a bit similar to the fact that in dimension two, a mirror of a K3 is again a K3. And you and somehow for the construction of this mirror family, do you have to count curves which touch, touch the corner of your? Yes, yeah, so I pray, yes, yes. So I mean, th th there are technical ways, if you don't want to work with corners, there are technical ways to go around that, but it's cleaner to say that you have my fixed divisor, my fixed variety, and you can't curve which possibly go into the corner. Because here you somehow would say you are primitive in the cone dual to this thing. Oh, but this is when three of the three copies glued together, then you have to count it. Yeah, that's right, but you need to count all of them. And in fact, in this example, there are really things going in the corner. In fact, there are a lot, a lot of them going into the corner. OK, so the upshot of this slightly uh, vague story is that uh, starting from a pair YD, a surface with an anti-canonical divisor, you count these general zero curves touching the boundary in a single point. And out of these numbers, you cook up generating series. You use these generating series as growing functions. And then you glue simple patches to get your mirror family. And the claim is that, in fact, this mirror family naturally come with a Poisson structure. So I, am not, I did not explain why, but some of the simple pieces have a Poisson structure, and the gluing transformation preserves this Poisson structure. So in fact, the output has also a Poisson structure. So in fact, the output is really a mirror, it's really a family of non-compact Calabiao. So yeah, when like fiber of dimension two, so it's a family of holomorphic symplectic varieties, and the total space is Poisson. And so in particular, you can ask, uh, is there a way to produce a deformation quantization of this mirror family? And here, because this mirror family comes out of this construction using enumerative geometry, you can ask, is, it a, is there a way to produce a deformation quantization by deforming the construction coming from mirror symmetry? Can we deform this game of counting general zero curve, which produces the mirror family? Can you in some way deform it to produce deformation quantization of the mirror family? Maybe I'll skip that. And the claim is that uh, you can do it if uh, you replace your count of genus zero curve by count of higher genus curves. So you will consider exactly the same kind of problem, curve of a given class touching the triangle in a single point. But rather than to consider rational curves, genus zero curves, you consider curves of arbitrary genus. And before, the game was to put this number into generating series. And now you still do the same, except now you have an extra variable, which is a genus. And you put an extra variable, edge bar to the power 2g minus 1, where g is a genus. And here, the fact to call it edge bar is not a coincidence. The claim will be this deformation at the level of enumerative geometry, replacing genus zero curve by higher genus curves is replacing our previous generating series by new generating series depending on h bar. And the claim is that you can deform the mirror symmetry construction by now gluing simple non commutative pieces. You can glue them together using these uh, generating series of higher generous invariants. And you produce a non commutative algebra, which is a deformation quantization of the mirror family. Is it associative? Sorry? Is it associative? Yeah, that's right. Associative, yeah, so it's part of the quantization condition. You produce some associative algebra, uh, non commutative, which is a deformation of the commutative algebra of regular function. How do you translate the associativity in that case into properties of a 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So some mode in this mirror symmetry business, there is something a bit uh, miraculous which is happening, which is first, even in the classical case, you count rational curves, and some of these numbers, uh, they uh, fit together in a way to produce some associative commutative algebra. And the way it happens is not obvious at all. Some of it's part of the, I mean, something you need to prove, and it's part of the, of the, of the non-trial part of the story. So. Maybe if you want, you can ask me later, but I don't want to say more here. And so here, here it's, it's even more true. The question, why going to higher genus? Why does it replace commutativity by non-commutativity of the algebra? And why is it still associative? Somehow it's even more non-trivial. So I will not try to explain why does it come out. Yeah, it just taken somehow as a black box. Can we go back to the formula? This, this formula you wrote for high disk? Yes. So if you put g equal to zero for the disk, yes. so it scales as h bar scales as inverse power. But previously, is it the same with h? Yeah, yeah. So this thing is like some normalization uh, convention. Yeah. So indeed, here starting the linear term as being one over h bar. Yes. And, and so, so this thing will be like one over h bar times the previous thing. So when h bar in the classical case, when h bar goes to zero, is it the same h? You do, do you recover the same h as previously? You said or. Yeah, so roughly yes, and, it, and it's roughly because uh, taking taking classical limit even in the most simple quantum mechanical example, it's not as simple as just setting h bar equal to zero. You need to take an appropriate limit. And so, but if you do things correctly, yes. So, for example, I could have, for simplicity, just forget minus one. Then I set h bar equal to zero, and I recover the previous formula. But it scales as one by h bar. Yeah, that's right. But this thing is just a choice that because I lack to write it like that, but I could have written it without minus one and putting the one over h bar somewhere else, which is less disturbing. So you don't need any regularization or you cannot, yeah, that's the question. So you need a regularization to have this h bar goes to zero, then this kind of contributes a zero contributes infinite. So, well. Yeah, I mean, indeed, there is a tricky point somewhere that, in general fact, when you go from quantum to classical, if you just take plug h bar equal to zero naively, uh, sometimes it's a wrong thing to do. But if you do things properly, everything works. Okay, so 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 now how, how is it related to our starting question? So we have our SL2C character right here. The claim, which is the same of Gross, I can kill Zebert, is that this thing is what I claimed before. This family is the output of the mirror constru symmetry construction applied to Y, a smooth projective cubic surface, and D, a triangle of lines. So you count your rational curves, you run the mirror mach uh, symmetry machinery, and the output is exactly this family. And now running this uh, quantum iogenous version of mirror symmetry, running the machinery, counting a genus curve, will produce a deformation quantization of this family. So now I arrive to the final point of this talk, which is that in the first part of the talk, I explained this kind of algebra business, this low dimensional link story, which was producing one deformation uh, quantization of the character variety. And here I've just explained you a different way to uh, construct a deformation quantization of the same geometry. So what we do in, in the two sides are really completely different. On, on the left hand side here, we realize your geometry as a character variety. And then you use the fact that it is a character variety to run the scan algebra story to produce a deformation quantization. Whereas on the other side, you just use the fact that it is a family of uh, non-compact Calabrian surfaces, which appear as mere family of something. And then deforming this uh, remark the mirror symmetry construction, you cook up a deformation quantization. And the theorem is that these two deformation quantization, uh, they agree. And so here the claim is that they agree in the strongest possible sense, in the sense that here you have explicit uh, generators, here you also have explicit generators, you map one to the other, and this map is an isomorphism. Okay, so at the very end, there was some physics slide that probably I will not really go into. So the claim is that roughly this is a slightly surprising connection between so low dimensional topology on one side. So on one side, you are really studying links and knots. 
So you are drawing curve on a full punctured sphere, whereas on the other side, you are counting holomorphic curves of any possible genus in a complex cubic surface. So these two sides seem a bit uh, unrelated. And somehow you can at least argue that such connection should exist from the fact that the same physical series, in particular n equal to four dimensional gauge theory, has essentially two different realizations for string and amp theory. And in one realization, the scan algebra story is natural. And on the other realization, the holomorphic curve story uh, is more natural. So here is a slide I already uh, put at the beginning. It's a summary slide or conclusion slide. So on the C side, add the low dimensional topology. On C side, add, add the enumerative geometry. And, uh, and the main result of this talk was the low dimensional topology gives you one way to produce the deformation quantization. The enumerative geometry gives you another way to produce the deformation quantization. And the two ways agree. And something I did not stress in this talk is that once you know that, uh, then you can uh, derive non-trial application. So uh, because you know about holomorphic curves in cubic surfaces, somehow you can prove stuff about curve on the four puncture sphere, which is a bit uh, surprising, but it's one application of this, this kind of connection. And sorry for being a bit over time, and I will stop there. Thank you. Are there any further questions? So you previously you remarked about this n equals to two is zero yes. Newton theory. Yes. So uh, as far as I recall, zero Newton theory has a finite moduli space, means finite number of points. How this is related to this uh, cluster? Sorry, the character variety. I did not. Uh, this one is finite, means finite number of points only. You count them to get an invariant for generic choice of metric. Okay. What do you mean by finitely many points? If you have so zero, you said zero within geometry. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. So so. Within geometry means it satisfies this zero within equations and it gives you a moduli space which is finite number of points that there is. Yeah. So 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 here I'm using cyberg Witten geometry in some kind of physics sense. So this moduli space is not a moduli space of uh, solution to cyberg Witten equations. It is some um, uh, a different terminology. In what sense? In physics, as I understand, but what do you mean by zero within geometry? Yeah. So it's part of the story of Sabir and Witten that given some n equal to four dimensional uh, gauge theory, uh, there is a corresponding uh, geometry attached to it, which in physics language controls a uh, low energy effective uh, theory. So, so, so in fact, so, so Sabir and Witten arrived to the mathematical Sabir and Witten equations through this kind of story, but it's a bit long to, to explain uh, the connection. And for the purpose of this talk, I don't know an uh, obvious direct connection. If you want, I can tell you more afterwards. But it's a bit a long story, so. Can you, can you do that uh, uh, deformation quantization with the, with the help in innumerable geometry for un other than X uh, surfaces? Or yeah, that's all. So in fact, so you could imagine generalizing this story. So so in fact, I say there are other examples where the character variety is still a family of surfaces, and there are still uh, this kind of del peso geometry complement of some divisor in the del peso geometry. And uh, but the ones which are really interesting are difficult. So definitely, you can run this construction, you can run this deformation quantization through enumerative geometry, but I don't know proof that it's agree with a version of the scan algebra. By forgetting the character uh, variety side, uh, so do the yeah. So, so certainly the do the five genus invariants uh, satisfy the right properties to give you a yeah yeah that's right. They produce one deformation quantization. What is difficult is to compute the numbers explicitly to know what is explicitly the non-commutative algebra. But yes, yeah, so the construction makes sense. But in this case, you've uh, computed explicitly, or you yeah that's right. In some sense, in this story, I just compute explicitly. Thank you.
you, you said that clerical varieties always uh, emit a Poisson structure, and you gave us like the, the formula for some specific examples. Yes. Can you like write down like a formula in general, or I mean, this is like a non-constructed proof? Or something? Yeah. So I think maybe in the world of character variety, maybe some keyword is maybe Goldband bracket, Poisson bracket. So I think you can write a formula uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for the torus, I explained it just has to do with intersection of homology classes. In more general, you can still, I guess, more or less write down a formula in terms of intersection of curves drawn in your, in your surface, but you need to be slightly careful about uh, some kind of geometric intersection numbers. But yeah, it's possible to write some kind of explicit uh, like geometric description. And, and there are various points of view on slightly related, like, but okay, let me just say that. Any further questions? Yeah. Uh, here you are considered the non-oriented links and uh, nodes. Uh, what happens if you consider the oriented links and nodes? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the story I've been describing is related to this Kaufman brackets kind module, which somehow is formulated in terms of unoriented framed links. And like for R3, it produces the Kaufman polynomial. But up to some easy transformation, it's more like the same thing as a Jones polynomial, and usually the Jones polynomial is for oriented unframed links. So uh, I would guess that at least in this R3 model, you can go from one description to the other. So I don't know. Yeah, so definitely there are things called like OMFLY, PT, scan algebras, which are like different from things Kaufman bracket scan algebra, in which I think you consider uh, oriented links. And they are just uh, different objects. So the, more it, the one which appears in this story is a uh, Kaufman bracket scan algebra, but maybe in some uh, not so unrelated story, maybe it's the other one will, will appear. We have one more question in the chat. So are the trace functions of SL2 character varieties the same as theta functions of GHKK? as your last theory implies for general SGF services. Yeah, yeah, that's so, so, so definitely in the example where I compute everything explicitly for this four puncture sphere, uh, the answer is yes. And somehow it's one consequence of the story uh, I'm describing. So for general uh, SGN, uh, as far as I know, it is still a conjecture. So, yeah. So in fact, I think even in this case, it was uh, not known. So in, this is like very specific case. The history proved it. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah.